हेलो व्यूअर्स माय नेम इज डॉक्टर राजीव वेलकम टू माय एजुकेशन चैनल यूट्यूब सर्जरी एंड ऑर्थोपेडिक एजुकेशन टूडेज डिस्कशन इज ऑन सर्जिकल एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ हाइडाटिड डिजीज इट इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट इन्फेक्शन ऑफ सर्जिकल इम्पॉर्टेंस इन ट्रॉपिकल एंड डेवलपिंग कंट्रीज इन द एंड प्लीज सब्सक्राइब टू अवर चैनल एंड गिव अस ए लाइक इफ यू फाइंड द डिस्कशन यूजफुल ऑल्सो डोंट फॉर गेट टू प्रेस द बेल आइकन बिलो टू गेट माई वीडियोज रेगुलरली Human echinococcosis or hydatidosis or hydatid disease is caused by accidental ingestion of eggs of the dog tape worm. The dog tape worm is a cestode of the genus Echinococcus and a symptomatic incubation period may last many years until the parasite larvae evolve and trigger clinical symptoms and signs. The species Echinococcus granulosus causes cystic disease and is the most common form. Another species Echinococcus multilocularis causes alveolar disease and it is becoming increasingly more common. The hydatid disease is common in tropical countries. The definitive host dog is the commonest source of infection and transmits the disease to the intermediate hosts humans, sheep, pigs and cattle. Dogs become infected by eating the viscera of sheep that contain hydatid cysts. The adult worm resides in the small intestine of the dog. It releases eggs that are passed in the dog's feces and are infectious to humans. Humans are an accidental intermediate host and an end stage of the parasite. After ingestion by an intermediate host, eggs hatch in the duodenum and release oncospheres. The hooklets of oncospheres penetrate the intestinal wall and migrate through the circulatory system into various organs. especially the liver lungs brain and bones in these organs the oncospheres develop into a hydatid cyst that enlarges gradually producing protoascolysis and daughter cysts the cyst has three layers and outer pericyst of compressed host organ tissues an intermediate ectocyst which is non infective and an inner endocyst the endocyst forms the germinal membrane and contains viable parasites which separates to form daughter cysts daughter cysts and brood capsules arise from the germinal layer new larvae called protoascolysis develop within the brood capsule the definitive host becomes infected by ingesting the cyst containing organs of the infected intermediate host Hydatid disease is most common in sheep raising areas and among sheep rearing communities where dogs have access to infected dead bodies of sheep. At present time the staging and management of hydatid cysts is based on the standardized ultrasound classification of WHO in formal working group on echinococcosis. Depending upon the status of activity of the cyst three groups have been recognized in group 1 or active disease the cysts are larger than 2 cm and often fertile in group 2 or transition phase the cysts start degenerating and enter a transitional stage because of host resistance or treatment but viable protoascolysis may be present in group 3 or inactive disease the cysts have degenerated partially or totally calcified and do not contain viable protoascolysis the parasite can invade virtually every organ in the body and therefore its clinical presentation may be variable the clinician should always keep a high index of suspicion the usual clinical presentation is a painful enlarging lump arising from the liver in a farmer patient in a phylactic shock due to rupture of the hydatid cyst is the emergency presentation men and women are equally affected at an average age of about 45 years symptomatic patients often present with abdominal pain or a palpable enlarging mass in the right upper quadrant compression of a bile duct or leakage of cyst fluid into the biliary tree may mimic recurrent cholelithiasis 
and biliary obstruction can result in jaundice. Jaundice and fever are present in approximately 8% of patients. The most frequent sign is hepatomegaly. Hydrated cysts are usually solitary and commonly involve the right lobe of the liver, usually the anterior inferior or posterior inferior segments. Common complaint is a gradually enlarging painful mass in the right upper quadrant with liver enlargement. Thus, a hepatic hydrated mass can cause a dull pain from pressure effect and a stretching of the liver capsule. Similarly, a lung disease, if large enough, can cause dyspnea. The liver is most often affected, followed by the lung. Any organ or several organs in the same patient may be involved. The disease may be asymptomatic and discovered accidentally during an ultrasound examination or CT scan done for some other condition or even at post-mortem examination. Doubter cysts communicate with the biliary tree and cause obstruction and dilatation of the entire biliary tree with all clinical features of biliary obstruction in addition to symptoms of parasitic infestation. Signs of raised intracranial pressure or unexplained headaches in a patient from a sip rearing community should raise the suspicion of a cerebral hydrated cyst. Minor trauma may provoke severe abdominal pain creating an emergency situation. Rarely, a hepatic cyst ruptures into the pleural cavity and the patient may subsequently cough up white material that contains ascolysis which have reached the tracheobronchial tree. Always maintain a high index of suspicion. There is a raised eosinophil count. Serological tests such as ELISA and immunoblotting point towards the diagnosis. Up to 90% of liver cysts are seropositive, whereas only 50% lung cysts are seropositive. The investigations of choice are ultrasound and CT scan. The ultrasound findings range from purely anechoic cystic lesions to a completely solid, inhomogeneous appearance. Ultrasound clearly demonstrates the floating membranes, doubter cysts, and hydrated sand in purely cystic lesions. A rosetti appearance is seen when doubter cysts are present. Calcification in the cyst wall is highly suggestive of hydrated disease. The diagnosis is made by combining a good history and clinical examination supplemented by serology and imaging. Overall, CT scan is the best imaging technique. Imaging methods may reveal hydrated sand, which is a fluid layer of different density. Hydrated sand contains protoascolysis. But the most pathognomonic finding, if found, is doubter cysts within the larger cyst. Ultrasound or CT scan of alveolar hydrated cysts reveals solid masses and plaque-like calcification. If biliary involvement is suspected, ERCP or percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography PTC may be necessary. The second commonest organ affected by hydrated disease after the liver is the lung. The right lung and lower lobes are slightly more often involved. The cyst is usually single but multiple cysts and concomitant hydrated cysts in other organs such as the liver may also occur. The condition may be asymptomatic and found incidentally. Symptoms include cough, fever, expectoration, chest pain and sometimes hemoptysis. Air may be present between the pericyst and the laminated membrane due to erosion of the bronchioles. This gives rise to a fine radiolucent crescent or meniscus or crescent sign on chest radiograph. When the cyst ruptures, the collapsed endocyst floats in the residual fluid, giving rise to the water lily sign on CT scan. Firstly, the patient should be given adequate drug treatment with albendazole, followed by puncture, aspiration, injection and respiration or pair through minimal excess surgery. The decision of only drug treatment or combined medical and surgical treatment depends on the number of cysts and their anatomical location. Asymptomatic inactive group 3 cysts may be left alone. Radical total or partial pericystectomy with omentoplasty 
or hepatic segmentectomy are other options if the lesion is in the peripheral part of the liver. Both radical that is resection and conservative that is drainage and evacuation approaches are equally effective at controlling the disease. Ascolicidal agents such as 20% hypertonic saline or 90% ethanol or 1% providone iodine are used during operation. These agents may cause sclerosing cholangitis if the cyst communicates with the biliary tree. Laparoscopic management consists of aspiration of cyst contents, deroofing the cyst, removal of the cyst containing the endocyst along with daughter cysts and injecting providone iodine or hypertonic saline as a scolicidal agent. Any communication with the biliary tree is overseen and pedicled omentum is sutured to the margins of the cyst. Cystopericystectomy or removal of the entire cyst intact is done for a small superficial cysts of the left lobe. The main treatment of pulmonary hydrated cyst is surgery. The options are cystotomy, capitonage, pericystectomy, segmentectomy or sometimes pneumonectomy. Medical treatment is less successful in pulmonary hydrated cyst disease. It is considered when the surgery is not possible or there is diffuse disease affecting both lungs or in cases of recurrent or ruptured cysts. During surgical resection, care must be taken to avoid rupturing the cyst with the release of protoscolysis into the peritoneal cavity. Peritoneal contamination may result in an acute anaphylactic reaction or peritoneal implantation of scolysis with daughter cyst formation and recurrence of the disease. Finally, surgery remains the treatment of choice for complicated cystic echinococcosis, for example, cysts communicating with the biliary tract, for most thoracic and intracranial cysts, and for cases where pair is not possible.